What is complexity? Is it a human that can learn to use tools and to communicate? What about a bobtail squid that houses a colony of bioluminescent bacteria that it harnesses for camouflage? Or the moon jelly with a very complicated life cycle? What about the sponge and the dinoflagellates that are able to build these intricate glass houses? All of these are examples of the complexity of biological systems. While some complexity is obvious, most of it is hidden from the eye. In biological systems, there are different levels of complexity, all the way from your small macromolecules that make up the cell to ecosystems and the biosphere. At each level of organization, new properties and rules emerge that cannot be predicted by observations at the other levels. These are called emergent properties. Thus, each integrative level must be studied and related to the other levels of biological complexity. The complexity of biological systems reflects adaptations to the environment. This can be the ability to survive in extreme habitats. It can be a morphological adaptation that allows organisms to sense their environment, or it can even be a behavioral adaptation such as the use of tools or the formation of colonies. All of these different changes happen over long periods of time. The question then is, what is the mechanism that leads to the development of these different characteristics that we observe in organisms today? According to the modern evolutionary synthesis, all evolutionary phenomena can be explained in a way that is consistent with known genetic mechanisms. Your DNA interacts with the cell and the cell with the environment. Selection then acts on the genetic diversity existing within natural populations, eventually resulting in changes in phenotype or characteristics over time. One important thing we have to keep in mind, however, is that evolution is not progressive, nor does it proceed towards a goal. As the famous evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould said, the history of life is not necessarily progressive, it is certainly not predictable, the Earth's creatures have evolved through a series of contingent and fortuitous events. Stepping back through time, we see that the origins of life started first with the generation of the key molecules of life, followed by the transition to the first replicating systems, and eventually into the formation of cellular life. Modern organisms can be classified into the three domains of life the unicellular bacteria and archaea, and the eukaryotes, which include both unicellular and multicellular members. The plants and animals that we are most familiar with are grouped into the eukaryotes. The Cambrian explosion, which occurred about 600 million years ago, marks the radiation of animal diversity. This event may have been triggered by an increase in oxygen levels and a change in seawater composition. During this time, many strange forms of life emerged, many of which no longer exist today. Life on Earth has undergone a series of speciations and extinctions. Overall, we do see an increase in the number of species in modern times. Recent estimates indicate that there are about 2.2 million marine species, with 91% remaining to be described. This indicates that there is a lot of biological complexity out there that remains to be explored. With all these different examples of life, we can now ask what makes an organism complex? We find that genome size does not always equal complexity. In fact, certain amoeba, which are morphologically simple, tend to have huge genomes. Gene number also does not equal complexity. The sequencing of more organisms has revealed that animals that appear to be morphologically simple can actually have more genes than humans, and vice versa. How then does complexity evolve? The answer may lie in the evolution of new genes, with new functions and novel modes of regulation. For example, 
the birth of new genes can occur via intragenic mutation or the change in the DNA sequence of a pre-existing gene. It can also occur through gene duplication, whereby one or the other copy of the gene can then evolve a new function. You can also evolve new genes through DNA segment shuffling or the mixing and matching of parts of genes. And finally, you can also acquire a totally new gene from a different source, like a bacteria or a virus, through horizontal gene transfer. Perhaps the most common way in which new functions can evolve is through gene duplication and subfunctionalization of the gene copies. In this example, the green gene is duplicated to form the blue and the yellow genes, which gain new function and are expressed in different territories within the organism. The subsequent loss of any one of these new copies results in changes in the phenotype of the organism. Changes in the way that genes are expressed can also result in different phenotypes. As shown in this example, a simple change in the number of genes that are controlled by the same transcription factor results in the formation of the wing types that are characteristic of different insects. The way in which information is transformed from DNA to RNA to protein provides many levels at which regulation can be exerted to modify the overall outcome of the process. For example, you can control how DNA is accessed through epigenetic regulation, you can control the way that DNA is transformed into RNA through different transcription factors. You can also control RNA processing and RNA regulation. And finally, you can control protein activity through different modes of protein regulation. The sum of all of these regulatory mechanisms results in your observable phenotype. These examples illustrate that complexity can evolve in many different ways. Thus, to fully understand how different organisms have attained their unique characteristics, there is a need to study a broader sampling of life, and this is where non-model organisms come in. Non-model organisms are essentially any organism that has not yet been established as a common experimental model, unlike the mouse, the fruit fly, and the worm. They represent the natural phenotypic diversity and genetic novelty that has evolved over periods of time in response to specific environments. Eventually, non-model organisms may also be developed into model organisms for the study of various biological questions. What are examples of non-model organisms? Well, essentially, anything in the realm of life is a non-model organism, from bacteria to fungi to plants and animals. Looking just at the animal tree of life, we readily observe diverse and complex features that are represented in different groups of organisms. This include multicellularity, immunity, specific tissue types like epithelia, neurons and muscle, organ systems like the nervous system, and different body plans such as the bilateral versus the radial body plan. There are many advantages to working with non-model organisms. First, they provide a more complete picture of the true complexity and diversity of life. They also enable the use of the powerful comparative approach to identify novel genetic factors and interactions between genes and the environment. Examples of groups of organisms with phenotypic diversity that make them amenable for comparative studies to identify gene functions and the molecular mechanisms behind unique morphological characteristics are your dogs, your sponges, and even your cnidarians. Of course, there are also some disadvantages to working with non-model organisms. Many of these are not readily culturable or widely available. Um, many do not have much information about their genomes, and there are few reagents and not many protocols for experimental manipulation. And finally, while genes may be conserved, regulatory mechanisms may not always be the same between different organisms. However, 
there are many methods that now advance the study of non-model organisms. These include advances in sequencing technology, like next-generation sequencing, and powerful computational approaches that allow sequence information to be gathered from different organisms. Advances in methods of genetic manipulation, such as gene knockdown techniques, genome modification technology, and new viral vectors might also be applied to non-model organisms. And finally, complementary experimental approaches in model organisms can also be used to interrogate the functions of specific genes that are discovered in non-model organisms. Given these tools and the inherent diversity and complexity of life, we are now ready to explore the fascinating world of non-model organisms. We can now ask questions such as, how did life emerge? What are the mechanisms underlying the diversity and complexity of life? And how does the shape of life reflect evolutionary history and the struggle for survival? Can you think of more interesting questions to explore?